Hi, I'm Denise Pritchett. Welcome to The Place of Hope. We're glad you're here and we hope you enjoy today's service. Make yourself at home. Good morning. It's so good to be here this morning. You braved the storm and came out. We're so glad that you did. Will you stand and sing with us? The greatest day in history. Put your hands together. Death is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out for Jesus is alive. be gloomy outside, but it's not in here. So I'm glad you're here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And I pray everything we say and do would please you. And Lord, I just pray that your spirit would be real here today. And I pray that you would do a work that only you could do, Lord. Thank you for what you've done thus far. Thank you for how you've allowed us to uh, follow you, accomplish what you want us to do. And Lord, we pray uh, that you would just continue to work in us and through us. Be with this day and we'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Watch the screen.
morning, everybody. This is going to be our uh, Trail Life kickoff for this year. I know a lot of you have helped out, participated in our fundraisers. I appreciate that so much. Um, this right here, not only is it a cell phone, a lot of you know what I do. Some of you don't. I work for Department of Public Safety. For a lot of you older guys, it's the old DOT. For Anthony, who drives trucks, it's probably some other words I'm not going to repeat in here. Um, when this phone goes off, this is the crash phone. It sends an alarm off and I've got to leave immediately. And usually when I go and I get there, it's not pleasant. Usually somebody's gone or s several people. Um, the thing that really got me going with this trail life made me want to kind of jump into this. And as y'all know, it's more of a Christian version of the Boy Scouts. They broke off from them when the Boy Scouts started taking a different direction. This alarm has been going off in our communities. I've done law enforcement for several years. Um, I've worked in the project areas. And the alarm's been going off for our youth, our kids, not only our, you know, in the project, but every, even in our own homes. And we haven't even realized that that alarm's been sounding off tremendously. And a lot of times we just ignore it. But I guarantee if that phone would ring with a normal ringtone, everybody would be running for it. Um, the reason I'm up here today, not only to kick it off, but we need some volunteers. We need some men to step up. We have AHG, and a lot of the women participate in that. And I find in the church that a lot of the women are, are willing to jump out there and go beyond what they, they have to for the girls. But we need the men to step up. I, you know, you look around, you look at statistics, you look at everything, look in the homes. We're hurting for the men, and that's, that's what's killing our youth. That's what's messing them up. Um, I really wanted to get up here and have a, make this a, a great, happy speech and talk and all that, but the truth is what it is. I just, this is what really kicked it off for me. I got tired of seeing kids at home at 9, 10 o'clock at night with no parents. I got tired of seeing them running the streets. I got tired of just seeing them when they have their parents and the parents aren't involved or don't have anything. They drop them off at whatever sport they're playing or they do this or that and then they're gone and they go do their own thing. And I know life's busy. Life's busy for me. I'm overwhelmed. That's why I've got this paper up here, and my wife is actually helping me now. She's uh, organizing this stuff for me because I'm clustered with it. October 1st, we're having our open house for Trail Life. Anybody that's interested in becoming part of Trail Life, having their kids join, or even getting out there and just flooding the community with just love, that's what we're trying to do. We need help. We need volunteers. Um, we're having open house, especially parents need to be there. It's mandatory. We need to have people there. We're starting kickoffs. We're going to start selling Boston butts cooked by Robert Massey. The last day to pick your Boston butts up or to, to get the money in is going to be the 7th of October. October 20th is when we will be giving them out when you come pick them up. We're selling tickets for $30. I believe Brody. Oh, Brody, stand up for a second. Brody, stand up. Wave your hand. All right, Brody is part of our troop. He has, a, as, as tall as Brody is, he's taller than me, He has, which isn't hard. He's got a mysterious ability to avoid the camera. So I'm going to put you on spot. Everybody that wants to buy a Boston butt, wave your hand, Brody. Wave your cast up. Come see Brody. Um, but he's not going to be avoiding the camera because next event we have, which is the air show. We are going to be going to the air show on October 14th. I know it's a Sunday, but we're going to have church at the air show. Maybe we're going to witness to some people out there. And we're going to bring the love of Jesus to them. And then we're going to watch some jets fly around. Also, be ready because we're going to have some more events coming up. They're going to seem a little crazy, but we want the whole entire church to participate in this. You're going to be getting dressed up. Um, you're probably going to get muddy, wet, but you're going to have some fun. Just look for the videos to come. You'll see it. I really, really, really hope everybody will start participating with the HG and with the Trail Life more. Get into it. Get behind these kids because they need it. This is going to be the next generation that sits in here. Right now, I've got to go back up on the hill. We need some more volunteers up there, too. Um, we're hurting with our kids. Please step it up. Step up to the plate and swing for it. We need it.
You said it was October 14th, right? The air show? Yeah, well, somebody, I just need somebody to preach because I'll probably go with them to the air show. I just want you all to know that. Hey, I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, Let me tell you this. If you're a first-time guest, we have several that are visiting with us today for the first time. Some of you here uh, for the ribbon cutting, and uh, we are glad that you're here. Uh, Today's a special day. Uh, But back in the back is guest information. We'd love to get some information from you and then also give some information to you about God's house as well. At this time, I want you to stand, fellowship one another, find somebody you don't know, welcome to the house of God as they play. We're glad you're here this morning.
act like visitors in your own home this morning. I'm telling you, it's quiet. It's like do we clap? Well, not that you have to be in a routine, but uh, I mean, is anybody excited about the Lord this morning? I mean, my Lord of mercy. I watched Miko Hardeman run a, t- a pump back yesterday. And you, lots of you, went eight nuts. I'm just saying. And then we come into the house of God and we're like, well, I mean, good night. What's the get all excited about? Has anybody thought about the fact you don't have to go to hell when you die if you know the Lord? Did you know that? I mean, goodness. Well, it's a great time to take up the offering right now, I guess, right? I mean, I mean, you know, he came up here and made y'all mad because your men ain't doing nothing. And uh, then I'm going to say, I want all your money. And you're like, well, I don't know why I came today. I'm going to know why you have because God's got something for you. Michael Mayfield, David Mayfield, I, I can't even see you back there. Come back up here, brother. I want you to pray for us. You're looking good after them knee replacements, my brother. Good to see you. I want you to pray for us. I want you to pray for our offering. And uh, we'll be, we'll be kind of putting some things together in the uh, next couple weeks. January, we'll be doing a men's conference. And we're actually going to be doing it together, and we're actually going to be doing it here. We just found that out this week. Is that right? Yes, sir. We're still on board, right? On board. Oh, okay, I just want to make sure. Uh, February. Oh, it's moved to February. Okay, February. And uh, sometime in 2019. How about that? But I love you, brother. I appreciate you being here. And uh, just pray for our offering. Would you do that? standing. Oh, 
Amen. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Uh, I want you to take your Bibles, turn to the book of Nehemiah. And uh, many of you are familiar maybe with the scripture or the story of Nehemiah rebuilding the wall. And this morning I want to be a little bit different because I want to spend some time thanking some people. Today is a, is a special day. Uh, and most of, I guess everybody knows if you don't, it's a special day uh, for our church today um, across the hall or across the road there. Uh, are, are five houses uh, that were basically purchased and built by you men and you ladies. And um, today we're going to actually cut the ribbon. Now, it's not usually that you're open until you cut the ribbon, but uh, we have had needs before the ribbon today been cut. And uh, we already have families that are living there. And uh, we had a family that moved in this week and moved back out. And so uh, we've been open for business for about two weeks now. And uh, so I'm thankful for that, that God has uh, opened up the doors and the, and the opportunities for us to share. I want to spend some time thanking some people, and then I also want to be in the book of Nehemiah, and I've kind of wrestled with the thought of what actually to do first. And um, so I, I want to read this text I just got from you first, because I think this is a, is a huge blessing. Uh, it comes from Kip this morning. It says, they have the ventilator turned off. He's been breathing on his own for about 30 minutes. His O2 is 98. That's talking about Big Fred, and we're thankful to God that he is uh, moving in a different direction. Amen. If you don't know, uh, uh, Kip, who is our charge of our maintenance and operations here, his dad uh, went in for open heart surgery, and then he suffered a stroke after that, and uh, so he's been really in some bad shape going up to, uh, t to now, and so this is a major, major praise report of being able to uh, move in the right direction. So um, if I, and I, you know, another thing, when you, when you begin to thank people, um, you know, the, the fear is oh, I'm going to leave somebody out. And I've done my best and I've prayed and I've asked God not let me leave people out that I need to be thanking. And uh, there are some people who says, don't mention my name. I don't want to know uh, this. Well, I'm going to do it anyway just because I want to make sure that I'm thankful and uh, what you do with it between you and the Lord. But um, I want to do this first. I want to pray. I want to be thankful for what uh, God has done uh, in Kip's life and in Fred's life this morning before we go any further because that's major. I'm thankful that Denise is here today. Uh, she, um, she's sitting over there laid out like she's on the couch, and her, her mom and sister and their family are there today. I'll be talking a little bit more about them in a little bit, uh, but I'm thankful that she's here and was able to come today. So uh, would you bow with me? We're just going to pray and thank God for, uh, for Big Fred, thank God for Denise and the different ones who uh, uh, are still in need this morning. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. And I thank you for the opportunity you've given me to be in your house, Lord. I don't take it for granted. I'm thankful that uh, uh, I have the ability to be here. I'm thankful that uh, I have the ability to be around such people who love me, uh, who love this body, who love you. And, uh, Lord, I'm thankful for all the blessings on my life. Lord, I want to thank you right now for, for Kip and his dad and uh, for their whole family, what they mean to me in this church. I pray for Fred right now as he, he continues to breathe on his own. I pray you continue to give his lungs strength. I pray, Lord, that you continue to work in his life. I'm thankful for this uh, accomplishment already this morning. 
Uh, Lord, uh, I am reminded of Glenda this morning who's come home. And uh, Lord, uh, Lord, I'm so thankful for Tanya and Randa, uh, Randy and Tanya that are here and their family. And uh, Lord, they've had uh, three weeks of just uh, uh, some struggles. And Lord, I'm thankful today that uh, uh, she's getting better as well. And we're so thankful for the blessings. I'm thankful for the people of God, Lord, who have bonded together and pray. And uh, Lord, that where prayer works whether we believe that or not. I'm thankful for that. And Lord, I ask you right now that you would be in this time. Uh, Lord, thank you for Denise and the strides that she's making. I'm thankful that she's here. And Lord, for her family, what they mean to me and her. Lord, I just pray right now that your will be done in this place. May we continue to give you praise, honor, and glory. Thank you for what you do for us. And we'll say it together all as a body. Amen. Amen. Well, you're in the book of Nehemiah. And uh, I want to start by just thanking a few people. And then we're going to look at the scripture of Nehemiah. Because uh, I want to run through this quickly. Uh, but I do want to thank you for what's happened. I was minded, Bob, would you stand up right there? This is Bob Stetson. Uh, I shared a little bit of this with you last week. Bob Stetson is from Florida. Uh, Bob um, is, um, <laughs> I'm telling you, it, it's amazing how I found all this out. But I was talking about that uh, I don't know how long it had been since we had broke ground and how long it had been since we're going to be cutting the ribbon today and all that, that timeline. And, and Bob spoke up right quick and he said, it's a year and 11 months. I said, how do you know that? He said, because a year and 11 months ago, as of, as of today, September 16th, he said, I was saved on the day that you broke ground. And uh, his son, uh, his, his grandson was one of them that held a shovel, Carson Chipwood. And, uh, and so he was saved that day. And so I'm thankful to God that a year and 11 months ago on this day, uh, Bob came to faith in Christ. And uh, he's, he lives in Florida. He's going back to Florida. And I said, he said, October, he's coming back. And he's coming back to, to stay. That's a good thing to hear right there. So, Bob, I'm thankful for your salvation. I'm thankful that you reminded me of this day and what that means. I'm thankful for my staff, keeping things going, uh, working, uh, many times hands-on there and many times working here uh, so that hands-on could be done there. And I'm thankful for that, for you guys and for you ladies. Uh, Greg Gaines, who put together our, our uh, logo uh, that's on the sign back there, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. William Pilgrim, is William in here? William back there, wave your hand, William. Uh, I couldn't put showers together without William Pilgrim because me and him together can cook it. We can cut it real crooked, but if you can find enough trim, we can clean it up, can't we? Ain't that right? So I'm thankful for you, William. I love you. And for people like Peggy and uh, Perry Berryman and Sherry, uh, Shirley Pulliam who donated dishes they'd had for years, didn't know what they were going to do with them. And, uh, and many of you have dishes that they had been storing for a while. For Bruce Bowers, Bruce, stand right there because I want them to know who you are. Uh, Bruce is kind of the right-hand man as far as organizing this whole project. Um, if it hadn't been for Bruce, we wouldn't know where nothing was at. And Bruce also keeps up with our, our inventory of our trailer when we go to the fires uh, and stuff like that. And, uh, and Bruce, it couldn't have been done without you. And I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for uh, what you brought to the table with your organization. So help me thank Bruce and give him a hand. Would you do that? Uh, Scoot Rice, would you stand right there? That's a Scoot Rice. He owns, um, he owns Mid-South Cage. And uh, Mid-South Cage, I went to Scoot when we started this project. And I said, here's something that I believe the Lord's telling me. And I said, I know you've got all this material. And I said, I need to know, um, you know, can I get my material from you? And if, and if we're lagging on the paying part, <laughs> uh, and you're going gonna, you're gonna to send the law after me or we're going to be good? I just want to make sure. And uh, I'll be honest with you, a lot of the things that he did and brought to the table during this project at Mid-South Cage and uh, materials that I'm sure that some things he paid for that he never got reimbursed for. I know a lot of that. And I'm so thankful for you, Scoot, and for, uh, for your investment in this project. And um, whenever we need it, he sent his trucks, he sent his guys, people like that. I'll be honest with you, we're blessed. And I'm thankful, Scoot. Would you help me give Scoot a great hand for part? <laughs> Shannon Carey, where'd you go, Shannon? Oh, you're back there now. I saw you over here and then back there. Stand up right there, Shannon, if you would. Shannon is the guy that runs the trust plant at Mid-South Cage. And I had the opportunity, a great opportunity, to be a part of uh, coaching staff when his boy Brent, Brent played ball at Hart County. Love these people right here. And uh, they're missing their church today to be here, but I asked especially because, let me tell you, there's a lot of times I could call Shannon. And I could say, Shannon, I need, and I would send him a material list. He would call. He would order it. He would ship it. Sometimes he would bring it. And, uh, and he had material on site. He doesn't even go to church here. He didn't get paid for it. It was on his time and in his dime. But he did it just to make an investment of what we were doing across the road. Shannon, I love you, brother. I appreciate it. Would you help me thank Shannon Carey? 
Rodney Jackson, is Rodney back there? I just got to tell you the story very quickly anyway. Rodney Jackson is a uh, retired licensed electrician. And I remember when we were putting the project together, we had not a licensed electrician in the entire church. And um, so I called Jimmy Durham one day, and he had been uh, bringing Rodney and his wife to church. And I said, um, what's his story? had no idea of anything. I said, what's his story? I said, uh, you know, was he retired, whatever? And so Jimmy looked at me. He said, uh, he is a retired licensed electrician. I thought, well, this is a God thing right here. And on top of that, Rodney Jackson uh, wasn't a believer, and he was the first one saved over at the Neighborhood of Hope uh, during this project over the last year and 11 months. And I'm thankful for Rodney Jackson and what he brought to the table with our, with our uh, electrical. And uh, I'm talking about uh, being very specific, and uh, we didn't have to worry about things getting passed. So if you're helping me, thank Rodney Jackson um, for that. There were people that worked over and above. There were people like Anthony Parham. Anthony's not here today, but people like him that would come and work extra hours when nobody was around, and they would leave him a list and stuff like that. I'm thankful for that. Brandon Moorhead. Brandon, stand back there, would you? Brandon Moorhead, he owns Adamstown Sod. And um, so I went to Brandon, and Brandon had been visiting our church, and, um, and I found out he was a sod guy. And I thought, well, I, I need some sod. So, uh, and so I went to him praying in Jesus' name that I wasn't going to have to pay for it, but I offered. You understand? You know how you, know, you, know how you do that. That's how preachers do it, you know. Brother, how much is it going to cost me to get the sod in there? He said, oh, we'll take care of it. I think God's in that. Yeah, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, he's wide open as a case knife, man, as far as busy. And I'm thankful to God for you, Brandon, for making an investment. Uh, he brought 15 pallets of sod over here on his dime, on his time did some grading, made sure that we were taken care of. And Brandon, I appreciate it. Would you help me thank God for people like Brandon Moorhead? <laughs> Sam Fortson, stand up right there, Sam. Sam is the very one that says, don't be calling me out. But he lives. He was our neighbor. Now he's still our neighbor, but he's back over here. This guy right here like a squirrel, y'all. If you need somebody to get in the attic, you call that one right there. And I mean, he worked circles around any of us. And one night I said, I need some insulation in. And we kept fighting, fighting, fighting. So one day, instead of calling him, I went to his house. And I, and I, I prodded him, I don't know how, to get in and over here and help me one house. And at 1030 that night, with it pouring down rain, we was putting sod in all five of them houses. So I'm thankful to him and uh, put the tent on our buildings. And uh, I love you, brother. I appreciate your heart. You have a heart for God, a servant's heart. And not just because you're helping the product, it's just your demeanor outside of that. And I'm thankful. I appreciate you being here, being sharing this day with us. Help me thank Sam Fortson. Would you do that? <laughs> Matt McCurley. Where you at, Matt? Stand up right there, Matt. Matt uh, and his wife, Diane, and their daughters have uh, been a member here probably a year or so. And, um, and so I, I found out he did work, cabinet work and whatever. And I asked him about that. He said, well, I did them ones in my house. So... Me and a guy went over there and looked at the cabinets. I said, that'll work. And so uh, every cabinet that's in that house, uh, this guy right here built. He didn't charge us a dime to do it. All we had to do is provide the wood. And I'm thankful to you, brother. I'm thankful for those cabinets. They look awesome. And if, once you get a chance to go in those houses, you're going to be thinking, good night. I want him to build my cabinets. And he's going to think, I wish you hadn't have done this because hey, I already got several jobs from this job. Hey, Matt, I'm, I appreciate you and I uh, appreciate your hard work. Help me thank Matt. Would you do that? Sherry Gibson and Kenny, y'all are sitting right over here to my right. Stand right there. One of you stand. Both of you stand. Uh, they've been in the granite business since for about 70 years, I think, haven't you? I don't know. It's good. And, um, and so they said, we're going to take care of the granite countertops. And they had some connections to the granite industry. They got, them, they got them cut. They got them laid. They got the sinks in there. And, uh, and then they even went out and got a donation for their house from another granite company. I think it was Star Granite. Is that right? And, uh, and I'm just thankful how you guys made that happen. You had a lot, a lot more knowledge than me or anybody else there, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you for taking care of that. Help me thank Kenny and Sherry. Would you do that? If you're an adult Sunday school teacher, I'd like for you to stand. If you're an adult Sunday school teacher, that's anybody that's not a single or a youth, anybody above. These men and these ladies that are standing right here, uh, they are responsible for the decoration and the furnishing of these houses. And I'm going to tell you, I see that hand, hallelujah. <laughs> you ain't raised your hands all day. Now you're right, that's good, all right. Um, they were responsible for furnishing and decorating these houses, cleaning them out. Uh, and there's many of you that are sitting here that helped them. Uh, you either provided money or you went and cleaned or you went and did this out of the other. And I don't know who all those are. 
But we gave each house to the Sunday school class and said, you take your class and you, and you, uh, you decorate it and you furnish it and all this stuff right here. And I'll be honest with you, it is amazing when you walk in those houses over there. You walk in them, you're thinking, wow, okay? And I'm just going to say this. You represent this entire body, and I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for what you did to make this happen, and uh, it looks incredible. And so help me thank all of our adult Sunday school classes. <laughs> Carol's furniture, Wayne's not here, but Chris is here. His son, of course, he's a member here. He, he should be here anyway. But uh, Wayne, his dad, owns Carol Furniture. He gave us mattresses and box springs at cost, and he also had... Uh, coffee tables and stuff that he that he literally gave to us. Uh, uh, Alan, Bobby, King, they uh, they kid me about my putting my my hay down before my seed, but they did provide both of them. And so uh, we've got grass over there because they it was I guess gra- I guess hay is grass, isn't it? It's we got a stand of hay over there about that high. It looks real good, all right. But it's green. That's all I know. Um, also, want to thank um, is Brian here? Or is he on duty today, Brian? Uh, Brian Anderson works for Chuck Finley. They did all of our concrete. And I'm going to be honest with you, we were trying to measure out stuff and, you know, get things ready to pour slabs. And Brian Anderson showed up and Chuck Finley showed up. And I'm talking about within a couple of hours, that thing was ready to pour. And I I realized real quick I was way out of my league. And I'm thankful for them and I'm thankful for their time. Uh, They came late at night and stayed until it was done. And uh, because of that, uh, we've got some solid houses over there. So they're not here, uh, maybe listening by line, online or uh, however, but let me help, help me thank them if you would uh, this time. <laughs> Lee Griffey is in the sound booth. I think you're back there. I see the orange shirt. Turn around to Lee Griffey. Lee Griffey uh, at the beginning of this was with Habitat for Humanity. When we started this whole project, I went to Lee and then he went to Darlene. Say standing, brother. And he went to Darlene, so Darlene, I'm going to ask you to stand. Uh, Darlene is, uh, is with Habitat for Humanity, and then Donna Bennett's behind her. Donna, would you stand? And there was just a lot of pieces of the puzzle right there. And so uh, we, we went with, uh, we said, we're going we're gonna to do this as a Habitat project. Well, in the process, some things changed. But I just want to say this, I'm thankful, thankful for the, uh, uh, for the, for the things that got done when we got started and, and, and kind of putting us in directions and plans that were drawn and, and the connections that we had that we would have never had. We never had. People would, people would come and do things because it was under the name of Habitat, uh, you know, and so we just like, well, we'll just use their name and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, they are in the process of getting ready to do a blitz build is when? When is that? First week in October, and they would do a blitz build where they'll build an entire house in one day. And uh, that's okay. We did five in two days. That's all I'm saying. I, I just wanted to share. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, I, I thank God for them. Thank God for Lee and the leadership in the beginning of this thing. So would you help me thank all of these from Habitat for Humanity? Uh, let me give you a, Rusty Carroll's not here. Rusty Carroll and his company did uh, uh, the siding on a couple of houses. McGee Heating and Air did our heating and air, and they did it for cost. They didn't even charge me any labor. They just charged us what it, it cost them. And then my brother-in-law is back there. Scott, stand right there if you would. Uh, this is Scott Mann. Scott is my brother-in-law. Uh, he came. He owns Blinds, etc. cetera. Uh, Blinds, etc. is a company that he started years ago and uh, putting custom blinds in people's houses. So uh, Tommy Derricott went down there and uh, got I don't know how many blinds. There was blinds everywhere. And I don't think I've told Tommy this, but he went down there and bought all the blinds back that Scott had uh, put out there. And didn't none of them fit, Tommy. I just want you, it has to be something you did. I, I don't know. But none of them fit. Well, when we found this out, Scott said, this just ain't going to be right. So he calls Lowe's, and this is on a Saturday. He calls Lowe's. He said, I need these many blinds, and I need them cut to this. And he said, and I'll be there in two hours and pick them up. He drove all the way to Lowe's. He picked up all the blinds. He put them all up. He installed everything. And I never got a bill. He just did it on. He said, this is my investment. This is my donation to the neighborhood of hope. I'm thankful for, uh, hey, I'm thankful for in-laws that you can deal with. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Hey, I love you, brother. I appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. (laughs) Is Dennis Roach in here? Dennis Roach is not here. Dennis did our plumbing. Patrick O'Brien, where are you at, brother? Stand right there. This guy is a workaholic, man. And there's a lot of things that got done in the end that would have never gotten done if it had not been for you. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, after work, coming over here, uh, doing, I'm talking about doing the floors, doing the painting, doing the trim, doing the whatever. 
And then all of a sudden he hired his wife because she calls me yesterday and said, I didn't know the codes of the houses because I had to put paint in the different houses. So I appreciate you delegate that to your wife right there. But Patrick, I love you. Help me thank Patrick for the extra work. I appreciate that. <laughs> Todd Hill is in the back back there. Todd, stand up there if you would. Uh, Todd's been with me since the very beginning. Uh, Todd is one of the... Uh, one of the reasons that we even built these, not because he was homeless, but because he was a fireman that the, the Lord saved not long after I got into the fire department. And uh, he became in charge of our, uh, of our neighborhood of, uh, or our trailer ministry when we go to the different uh, house fires and stuff. Do whatever you want to do, no matter when, however much you need to do it, and I'm thankful for him. And um, now he's done recruited. Alan King is a part of that ministry as well. Uh, Alan is part of, our, uh, of our, the Hope Trailer and so the other night we had a fire and didn't get to go, and Todd called Alan, and here they went. Went on their first fire together. So it was pretty cool. I, I mean, I'm thankful for that. But, Todd, I love you, brother. I appreciate what God's done in your life, and um, I'm telling you, we're better because of you and your heart for, to serve. Give Todd a great hand. Would you do that? How many of you have rode by the neighborhood and seen the sign out there? Amazing. Buck and Angela, where are you at? Stand up right there. This is the people that did that right there, son. You're talking about awesome. That looks awesome right there. I'm telling you. That's sharp. <laughs> Morris Phillips donated washers and dryers. I don't even know if he, he's back there. I see you back there, Morris. I appreciate all that. Uh, uh, Mike pulling did our gutters for half price. New Bethel Congregational Holders got involved. What we we're doing, Walmart gave us our first, uh, gave us our first donation. Um, also, the football team from Hart County got involved in that. And now... We have a chapter in Elbert County, Faith Baptist Church, has a trailer now, and uh, they're our Elbert County chapter, and we're the Hart County chapter. And uh, I just want to say this. If you, uh, let me say th this last part, too. If you have been a part, it didn't matter if you worked one hour through the whole year and 11 months. If you've been a part of that project, if you ever brought a sandwich, uh, if you did anything, if you cleaned up, you got out there in the snow and put siding on. Yeah, there was snowing that day. And, uh, or whatever the case may be, all over this building, if you were a part of it in any way, I want you to stand right there if you can, right where you are. If you had any part of it at all, you had any kind of help in any of the work on it, stand where you're at. Wow. Wow. Give the Lord a hand. Would you do that? Now I want you to take your Bibles and look to Nehemiah. The, the book of Nehemiah, beginning with chapter number one, and we're not going to read all these verses, so don't get alarmed, but I want to just give you just the thought of the miracle of the mission, because here's what happened. In, in Nehemiah chapter one, Nehemiah had walked by the walls that were destroyed by fire, and they were, they were, the, they were in rubble, and he went by there, and he looked at it, and the Lord so impressed on his heart that uh, the Bible says that he sat and he wept. He basically just broke down. And he had a passion, and he begged God, Lord, if you, are, if you would just give me the favor, if you would give me favor with the people. In verse 11 in chapter 1, he says he asked God to give him favor and to promise, prosper him and, uh, and allow somebody like him. He said, well, what kind of person was he? Nehemiah was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And what he did is when, when the king, when he was going to give the king a drink, he would have to drink it first because a lot of people would want to poison the king. And so if it was going to kill the king, it was going to kill Nehemiah first. And he said, if somebody as low as me, would you, would you just give me favor in this project? Would you give me favor in this project of, uh, of rebuilding the walls? And so in chapter 2, when Nehemiah approached the king, King Artaxerxes, he says, you know, every time you approach me, Nehemiah, he said, there's... You seem to have a smile on your face, but today's different. I can see right through some things that are going on in your life. So tell me what's troubling you. See, when you're in the middle of something, on the outside, there's a lot of times people can see what God wants to do in your life clearer than you can. And he looked at, he looked at Nehemiah and he said, there's something wrong with you, Nehemiah. There's something that, that you don't have that smile. You don't have that freshness. You don't have that glow. And let me tell you something. Many times... When you're in the middle of something, that's when you need people to surround you because in the middle of it is where the pressure will get you. And so a lot of times you're thinking, man, I'm doing all these things for God and Satan will do everything he can to discourage you and to tear out all the joy he can because if he can destroy your joy, he can keep that joy that you have from spreading to anyone else. Because his greatest tool in his toolbox is the tool of discouragement. How many of you believe that? Now, 
He, he said, there's something all over your face. When he told the king what he was going to do, the vision that God had given him, he asked permission. Look what he asked for permission for. And he asked for permission for recommendations. He wanted letters signed so that he could have favor. He also asked for materials. He said, I'd like to go to the king's forest and cut down trees for beams. He said, I'd also, uh, he said, I'd also not only have uh, materials, but later he gathered workers. Workers from every kind of trade you can imagine. The whole chapter is full of what people did and how they did it and who he, who he employed. Verse 18 of chapter 1, he tells, his, tells them his vision, and look what happens. They buy in. They buy in all of a sudden. They said, and here's what it says in verse 18. He says, let us rise and build. Let us rise and build. In, in chapter 2, verse 18, he said, let us rise and build. Now, here's the thing. There's a lot of times God may give you a vision to do something. And somebody will say, Chris, I'll tell you what, what a vision. Oh, man. Go. Let me tell you something. That vision ain't worth a flip if the people of God that you're trying to get to go with you don't buy in. And here's the thing I'm most thankful for when we have a vision like this. The thing I'm thankful for is that God allows us as a team to give us buy-in to be able to work this thing together. I'll be honest with you, I couldn't do that. I can't do that project by myself. I didn't even know which end to start on. I really didn't. But God began to surround me with people and things and, and, and resources of things. I'm thinking, somebody's got to help me here. Somebody's got to show me what we need to do and all that kind of stuff. But how many of you know this? When you're doing something for God, there's always naysayers in your life. Always. Always naysayers. In this case, it was Sanballat and Tobiah. They were two of the people that kept coming along, and their name pops up chapter after chapter. And Sanballat and Tobiah. And Sanballat and Tobiah. Well, with names like that, I'd probably be sour too, you know, if your name was Sandballot, you know? And so they come to him and they would say, even if a fox walks across us, it'll fall apart. He said, why a fox? A fox is the lightest stepping creature around at that time. He said, even if a fox walks on it, it'll fall all to pieces. Negative people. Now listen to me. Somebody made a statement one time. He says, if you share your dream with someone and no one laughs, then your dream's not big enough. There are some things that God's placed in your heart for some of you. There are some things that God's placed in you that you want to do, but you're afraid to share it because you're afraid they'll laugh. People will think you're crazy. Can I tell you something? As I said before, if you share your dream and nobody laughs, then maybe your dream's not big enough. Can I tell you something? That God has more for you. In fact, the Bible says it in Ephesians 2. It says, unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all that we could even, listen, ask or even think. Sometimes we don't have to ask. We get to thinking about something big and we back off and say, oh, no, that could, that could never happen. But Sanballat and Tobiah, they were the naysayers. Now, here's the thing. In this project, we didn't have a lot of naysayers. We really didn't. We didn't have somebody say, oh, y'all are crazy. We had a lot of people patting us on the back. So what's the trouble with that? One time, uh, here's, here's some trouble with people patting you on the back. Be careful. Pride takes over. Be careful. Say, yes, sir, we are getting it done. I'll have you know. Pride. Here's another thing. They'll love you as long as you do it, as long as you don't ask them to help. <laughs> hey, would you get involved? Yes, yeah, a great project. And then, that's just something I've realized. And I don't know, I, all I can say is thank the Lord. But one of the things that I see is that we had the favor of God through the entire project. Now, I'm thankful for that. I can't explain that. But we had God's favor through the whole project. People stepped up, people did, people committed, people did things. In chapter 3, look what it says in chapter 3. And we see all different kinds of people that they were a part of. Now, I want to give you just something, just, just history right here, just to give you some size, kind of calculate some size. The length of the wall was like two and a half miles long. It was in a circle around the entire city of Jerusalem, but it was two and a half miles long that they, say, that they tell us. It was somewhere around 12 meters high. And the average thickness was about eight to two, eight feet. And you think, now, how in the world is that possible? When I was standing in line to get into the city of Jerusalem in the year 2000, I looked at those very walls and I was thinking, how in the world did they build these walls? And I realized that, man, the thickness is there, the, the length is there, the height is there. It is, it is over, it, it's kind of amazing to see that, wow, they built this wall. How in the world did they do it? But here's the thing, they had gates and then they had walls. But I want you to look at chapter 4, verse 6. This is a key verse in the entire building of the wall of Nehemiah. And I believe it's the key verse in any church 
And in the church, as we build the neighborhood of hope, we built the neighborhood of hope. Nehemiah 4, 6. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. Look at this. Somebody say this with me. For the people, say the next part, had a mind to work. I have used this story, I've used this scripture many times in talking about this body. The people have a mind to work. One of the things, Denise, and I know is we talk about a lot is that we have some incredible people in this church. We have some incredible people. I'm talking about you. We have some incredible people in this church that when there is a need, I've seen people step up. No matter what the cost or what the need, I've seen people step up and make some things happen. And I can tr truly say, and you know, we're talking about it as a body. There may be one or two that don't have the mind to work. But I can tell you, as a body of Christ, and the people had a mind to work. See, when Scripture, uh, when scripture picks it up in chapter 4, you've got the naysayers that are walking alongside of them. And then verse 6, it says, six, six, it says it has, they had a mind to work. And look what it says. It says, we built it <clears throat> just, just, just so that you don't forget. When we built this project... In two days, we framed four houses. In two days. All right, and think about how, the, when, we, when we got here, we spent a hundred, we don't know how we spent many months framing one house. And we realized we were going nowhere fast. And so we had all the stuff delivered, and we got four contractors, and we had them all laid out there, and we got everybody ready. And then we gave everybody a crew, and they had, many of them have not even met until the day of. And I mean, it was just like, what in the world's going on? And it, listen, it was 100 degrees, if not hotter, both of those days. And people looked at me and said, could you not pick the hotter day? <laughs> I guess not. Anybody can do it when it's 60 degrees and the wind's blowing. <laughs> so, I mean, it was hot as hot can be, wasn't it? Lord, it was hot. And I remember the last day, the second day, we were, we were just about to nail up and somebody put the, the wood up there getting ready, or they hadn't put the wood up there yet, and everybody's down and we look up and that house number four, where the family's in right now, didn't have any wood up there for the ten. And three brave souls had to climb back up on that ladder and put that, I mean, they were ready to kill each other. They were so, it was so hot and so tired and so mad. I was just like, oh, no, no. And we walked in here barely ever to put one foot in front of the other, and we walked in here the next day, and we were proud. We walked in here, and we were proud, son. We looked across that, and somebody said, man, what are y'all doing? Oh, we built that in two days. Yes, sir, get you some of that. We did that. Now, it didn't take two days to finish the rest of it. Come on. It was forever. And what God was teaching me during that time is, hey, are you going to trust me, or are you going to trust and so what I realized is during that time is that we have faithful people to do a lot of great things. And then we put some siding on one day. It's 100 degrees when we build them. It's, one day we're putting on siding. It's snowing. And today it's coming a hurricane. <laughs> what a deal, right? Hey, anybody can do it when it's good weather, right? My goodness. You know, and so, and then when the houses were decorated, I mean, senior adults didn't let no grass grow, buddy. We said, we're going to start decorating on this week. Two weeks early, they're already low. They're showing up. I said, we ain't even got the insulation in these things yet. And, buddy, if, if they would have seen their house the night of that insulation, they'd have run me and you out of town, wouldn't they? It was this deep, y'all, in their bedrooms with all their stuff in there. I told Sam, I said, you're going to have to do something. I don't know what, I, what you're going to do, but you're going to have to do something. <laughs> you're going to love it when you look inside. I want you to look at verse 17, and let me finish up, kind of head to the end with this. Look at verse 17. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that one had uh, one, so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other they held a weapon. The enemy was coming at them so strong that it got to the point that they had a, they had a construction tool in this hand and a weapon in this hand. And it just kind of shoot, it kind of shouts out to me that let me tell you something. When you're doing something for the Lord, the enemy's going to come at you. And he'll continue to come at you. And he's not going to stop. And so you've got to be willing to say, Lord, I know. So a lot of people say, you know what? The, the battle was just too hard, so I just had to quit. No, during the battle, you've got to build and you've got to fight. And when God's doing a work in your life, man, I'm telling you, it don't, it don't, ever, it don't ever lighten up sometimes. Don't ever think that the enemy is ever going to quit when you're doing a work for God. Look at verse 19. 
Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great, extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. When they started, they were probably all in one big pot of people. And as the wall grew, they began to spread out. Two and a half miles were spread out. Can you imagine that? And then they got a little, they got a little, dis, you know, they got a little, uh, the fellowship wasn't as good. We, did, we couldn't sing Kumbaya anymore because we'd grown a little bit and we, we spread out a little bit. And let me tell you something. As we begin to reach people, as we've reached people for year after year after year, it goes from warm and fuzzy to where we kind of feel like we're on the battlefield sometimes. We're, we're stretched out and uh, we don't have that, that community that we'd like to have. And that's, that's work. That's hard. Okay? But I want you to know something is that when you're in the process, as you begin to do a work for God, we've got to get our mind on the work and sometimes not on the workers. So we've got to be careful with that. See, think about the wall being two and a half miles wide. Man, I'm talking about some separation. I want you to look at verse 23, and then we'll close. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off their clothes, except everyone took them off for washing. Here's what it meant. They were never off duty. They never quit. They had work clothes on all the time. I remember Coach Bill Chappell was a longtime coach at Dalton. One of the, I think he was the second winning his high school football coach in Georgia. And I went to, I was doing 12th member of the where we started down in Dalton. And I remember one day, one night on a Friday night, I'd come there and I was traveling with another team, but it was, our team wasn't in the playoffs, so I traveled with Dalton that day. And I remember they walked, put us in this room. And for an hour and a half to two hours, we sat in a dark room where you couldn't even see your, your I mean, there was no talking. You couldn't hardly anybody breathe. It was just blank. And all of a sudden, about an hour and a half before game time, Bill Chappell come and kicks the door open with this, like this. And he, and he flips a light and says, all right, boys, get your work clothes on. And they went nuts inside that room. And they put the uniform on, and they went out there and did work now. They went out there and got after it. And I thought to myself, when I read this right here, these people never took their work clothes off. They never took them off. And I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of times when we say, you know what, I need to rest. And we all do need to rest. But chapter 5, there was an outcry from the people. And in verse 15, and this is the last thing, and we're, and we're done. 15 and 16, I just want you to listen to these words. So the wall was finished. Look at this. On the 25th day of Elul. Look at this. In 52 days. 52 days from the time they started, this wall was complete. 52 days. Are you kidding me? We're talking two and a half miles of stone, eight foot thick, 12, 12 uh, feet high, and it was finished in 52 days. I want you to look at the rest of this, the rest of this verse. Look at verse 16. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes. Look at this. For they perceived that this was a work done by our God. And I want to make sure you don't miss this. You need to understand that when you look across the road, when you go uptown, you look walk in a coffee house, or when you do anything, when, when you see all these ministries that are going on where people are ministered to and people are brought to the Lord, you need to understand, don't you ever forget, this is truly a work of God. When you look at a church out in the middle of the country like this, and where people actually want to come, you have to know that this is truly a work of God. There's nobody any more special. There's nobody that's so talented that they're coming for the show. And they listen, it's not coming for anything, but this is truly a work from God. If you believe that, would you give the Lord a great big hand this morning? <laughs> if Stacy comes to play, I just want to I want to end with this and then we're going to we're going to cut this ribbon and we're going to be If it's not coming a hurricane outside, you can go over there and look at them. I don't know. Here's something else I don't want you to forget. Any civic group, and I'm not knocking them because I'm thankful for the good work that's done, but any civic group in the United States or any part of the world can build houses for people. Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that and say, listen, I want to help people. There's nothing wrong with that. Thank God for that. But the one thing that separates this neighborhood from just a feel good getting a house ready for somebody, the one thing that celebrates that, uh, separates that is the gospel. See, our whole thing has got to be that we're building a home for somebody who get, finds themselves in a position to need some help. Many times in scripture, physically, Jesus would take care of the physical so it would give him a platform to take care of the spiritual. 
And our goal has to be not that we're building a home. Thank God for that. I'm thankful we're doing that. But our goal is not to build a house. Our goal is to build a house so that we have an opportunity to share God's word in the gospel so that people may come to Christ. See, you may find yourself in a position where you said, man, my world is turned upside down. I don't know how in the world I'm going to get through this. People, there's a a big controversy. Did God cause that or did God allow that? I'm not going to split hairs with you there, but I am going to say this. When you find yourself in a position to where you don't know how you're going to get out of it, it may be that God has allowed you in that spot in your life because he wants to do a great work in your life. He may say, well, I, I don't think I deserve this. I'll be honest with you. If we got what we deserve, we'd all be in hell today anyway. But the fact that we build a home for somebody who finds themselves destitute from fire, flood, or natural disaster, or or some other kind of something that we've had to deal with already, because of that, God allows us as a church to come in and say, listen, we're going to take care of your physical. We're going to give you groceries. We're going to do all those things. But I want to make sure that you understand that the, 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 the foundation of this is not a place to lay your head. The foundation of this is a place to change your heart. And God wants to take the gospel and he wants to do a work in your life. And the gospel can only be done by the spirit of God. And you say, I had no intention of giving my life to the Lord. Well, I can tell you one thing. You may not know the intentions of God. But God places you in a spot where he says, you know what? I've placed you here because I want to do a work in your life. And here's what I do know. Is that there are many times I don't have a clue what God's doing in my life. But I know this. I know that there are some of the roughest times in my life I can look back and realize, man, God was leading the whole, God was leading that position the entire way. God was doing that. He said, well, Chris, I, I don't have a clue what, if I can really live this or not. I don't know, I don't know if, I can, if I can do that or not. No, that's why it's called faith. That's why you step out on something or you land, step out on nothing and you landing on something. The, the, the substance of the things hoped for. Evidence of the thing not seen. So it, it's, it's walking by faith and saying, I don't understand this. No, that's why it's by faith. And you're saying, Lord, I know you're the only thing that can change my life. You're the only thing that makes sense. You're the only thing that can do a work in my life. I found myself in a position where I don't even know what's going on. I don't even know how to get out of this. And I'm going to tell you something. God can work in those destitute times of your life greater than any other time in your life. Because what I've learned is you're most vulnerable. We're most vulnerable when we're at that point in our life. So I want to ask you, if you would, to bow your heads all over this room. And I want to ask you a question. The same question we've been asking for years, and that is, do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know if you died, you'd go to heaven? Oh, I'm so thankful for what today represents. I'm thankful for all the many things that God's allowed us to accomplish. But I never want to get away from the gospel that God wants to use the gospel to change your life. The Bible says that whosoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm thankful to God that I'm a whosoever. And he'll take me just like I am and loves me too much to leave me that way. But God wants to change my life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, behold, is a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things become new. So very simply this morning, do you know the Lord? Do you know that you know that if you die today, you go to heaven? If you don't, I'm going to tell you something. You've come to the right place this morning. And you're here this morning. You've never trusted Christ your Savior. I want to pray a prayer, not magical words, because God knows the intent of your heart. But I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. And if you want to invite Christ into your life, I'm going to ask you to pray it silently in your heart. Something simple like this. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? The best way I know how, I surrender my life to you. I ask you to come into my heart and be my personal savior. From this day forward, I want to follow you. I repent of my sins, ask you to forgive me and make me new. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. No one's going to come to you, point you out, embarrass you, but you be honest this morning to say, Chris, today I prayed that prayer. I invited Christ into my life. I know it's about the gospel. I know that God wants to change my life. Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. You're asking, you prayed that prayer. I'm going to ask you if you would right where you are. 
If you'd just be honest enough to lift up your hand and say, listen, pray for me. Would you do that right now? Sick child, or maybe today you decide to stay home, but you came across our Facebook page or our website, you heard this sermon, and God spoke to your heart. Scripture says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It also says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, behold, is a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things become new. Almost 33 years ago, I realized I was a whosoever and God changed my life. I was 19 years old. And I can tell you for 33 years, it's been as fresh today as it was then. Maybe today you want to make a decision for Christ or maybe you already have. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you could contact us on Facebook, call our phone, or you could just uh, look our website up. We would love to hear what God may have done in your life today. I hope you have a great week, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope this sermon. I want to ask a couple of you to join me um, up front, uh, and then uh, John and Bruce, come on up here, brother. Uh, just stand right down here. Um, and Lee, Lee, come back here. Scoot, and those adult Sunday school teachers that stood up a while ago, I'm going to ask you to join us down here as well, if you would. You taking a picture, Molly? We need to come up here then. You come on up here, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to take hold of this ribbon. I want y'all to look at some scissors, y'all. Hey, and they are sharp as, they're like hedge trimmers. They're sharp as a razor. I'm going to ask you to just grab it. You face me good, and you, you were a step ahead of me. I'm going to ask you to back up right to the congregation. Just back up, okay? Now, somebody said, I'm glad I'm not in that picture. Well, that's where you're wrong. If you're, in, if you're sitting down, I want you to stand, all right? Ah, there we go. Good, good. Now, I want you, if you're here, I want you to slide and connect all the way across the bottom. If you're at the top, I want you to come a little closer, okay? I don't want you being there like spectators. Come on down here and join the family, all right? I like it. You might want to go up. You might have to get up there just to be fine. Bob Stetson, come right here with me, brother. Wow. I wish you could be standing here and look back. It's pretty impressive, I'm telling you. It looks awesome. Uh, I will say this. Uh, this is a... Get right on in there with me. I want you right beside me. This is a major accomplishment that you guys have been a part of, and I'm thankful to God for it. I really am. Thankful for uh, your hard work. Uh, somebody says, what are we doing next? Don't know right now. We're not, uh, <laughs> I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. There ain't no next right today, all right? <laughs> but, uh, but here's another thing. I, honestly, I prayed this morning, God, I don't want to just be slack concerning what you want to do. But as we said, the ministry starts now. Uh, a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of work that went into this. And a lot of you had a lot of things to do with that. Um, but the ministry starts now and I'm thankful. 
Uh, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your hard work and the many things that I hear you, brother. I like it. Uh, and and just, uh, just the opportunity we've had to do it as a family. And uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm thankful for our guys. And I'll be honest with you, pray for our team. Again, we prayed for them the last couple of weeks. We'll pray for our team again because uh, the calls are readily coming, aren't they, aren't they John? And uh, pray for John and Bruce and uh, who else? It's Stevie and Cindy and yes. Jeff and Melanie, okay? So they got some work to do. And um, so I, I am thankful. Like I say, once again, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the, um, um, just for the accomplishment. So, I don't know, I've never done a ribbon cutting, so uh, I guess we should get over here and cut it, won't we? Huh? You got to smile, y'all. <laughs> We're all smiling. All right, you got to, you going to wave, or do you wave, or you just shout? What do you do? <laughs> just cut it, all right. Just cut it. Well, let's, let's sing a song. No, I'm just kidding, all right. One, two, three. Hey! <laughs> it's, it's officially open. Now, if you want to brave the weather, uh, we'll go over there and open, those, the, open the doors for you. You're welcome to go. Uh, we'd love to show them to you. Um, so anyway, um, the, only, the only announcement I have is my life group tonight is going to be an E100. And so if you don't know that, you're dismissed. I love you. I hope you have a great day.